Today I want to talk about uh, CPUs and a little bit about RAM and uh, specifically I want to talk about like why do we choose CPUs because CPUs are kind of like the brain of our operating system, I mean of our build and it is one of the most important things that we purchase uh, because it dictates everything else that our CPU can possibly do and a lot of consideration has to be put into that thought. Uh, because it also could be one of the most expensive pieces of the build. Uh, normally the two most expensive pieces of any build are the CPU and the graphics card. And I'll talk about graphics card at a later time, but for right now, we're gonna focus on CPU. Uh, so the central processing unit, uh, you'll hear the things like, it's the brain of the computer, it's the heart of the computer. There's lots of ways that people like to identify it. Uh, but for the most part, it's it's where all the calculations happen at. Uh, computers basically run off ones and zeros. And all that a CPU is doing is math. And math, lots and lots of math. And it actually has special pieces into it where you can actually add in uh, caches to be able to save equations. Um, so, that's all that's all cpu does is math but it's the workhorse of every single thing that it's in a computer so it's extremely important on what type of cpu you choose and understanding why you choose and do certain things with cpus uh, i have a couple that i want to talk about today uh, here i have a really old uh it's not in use on any of my stuff anymore uh, so this is a 556600K. So that's all a Intel chip is in size and shape. Uh, they're pretty small. Um, we call wafers, wafers with some metal sitting on top of it. Um, and this guy does all the all the calculations that a computer can do. So this is a 3950X. It's an AMD chip. Uh, this is their highest of their normal standard uh, in the Ryzen series. This is right about uh, the next level up is going to Threadrippers, and this is about as good of a chip as you can get for a personal station as, you, as money can afford. Now, Intel chips might occasion to be a little bit more expensive, but uh, this one's about a $750 chip. It's a workhorse. This can do a lot. This little chip right here is designed for workstation activity. Uh, it's kind of interesting if you actually compare the two, uh, AMD and Intel, uh, uh, comparatively, like if this chip here to uh, like an i10-10,000 series, uh, the 10,000 series will do better in gaming. Uh, one of them is uh, sorry, four chips there. One of them is an Intel chip. Three of them are AMD chips, and they all have different uh, different roles in processing. Uh, they all have different things that they're capable of doing, and there are a whole more spectrum of chips out there. You have Celeron chips that you uh, have in your cell phone devices. Uh, you can go buy a um, a Chromebook, and it's probably going to have a little Celeron chip in it. It's designed for mobile devices, and they use less heat, less, uh, uh, less, they create less heat. They use less power. They're more energy efficient, uh, but they are not going to do gaming or uh, Photoshop or Premiere or any of those activities. So your your chip has to match what you're trying to do. Then you have these things called like thread counts and core counts of two cores, four cores. This one here, the 3950X, this runs at 12 cores and 24 threads. So each core runs a thread. So it can do a lot of tasks at the same time, which makes it more efficient at running Photoshop. Uh, and being kind of that workstation mechanic. Now, for home use and business use, there is another level up when we talk about this. Uh, the AMD side, we can go to the thread rippers, which are the biggest uh, and probably the most powerful version of a CPU that you can bring into home use. 
um, and they are also significantly more expensive. Um, these chips can range between like two or three thousand dollars. They're meant to do a lot of tasks. Uh, these aren't your like your standard little chips that you uh, that you do for gaming or anything like that. Uh, these chips are very much processors. Right? They are meant to do massive amounts of calculations as fast as humanly possible. Okay, I'm going to start with this i5 processor. So this is i5 uh, 6600 processor, the one I just showed you. It has six megabytes of cache, and I'll talk about that here in a second, and 3.9 gigahertz. Uh, giga thousand hertz time. Uh, a processor does all their stuff on a mathematical equation of how much time it takes to do it. When you hear these terms like overclocking and stuff like that, we're talking about fluctuating that amount of time it takes to do a task. So 3.90 into the thousands of hertz as it processes tasks. And some stuff that we can take a look at here. So this is a four core CPU with four threads, meaning that each core is running one thread. It's built to be able to do pull about 65 watts. So it's not a lot of wattage, but it's enough to be able to run it. Uh, these higher end CPUs, they could be 90 to 100. Uh, and even when you start talking bigger than that, we could be talking a couple hundred uh, watts just to run the CPU. And you can see on this performance on this, this is not a horrible chip in any shape, way, or form. The things that we have to worry about is like down over here where it says max memory size. That i5 is only capable of doing 64 gigs of RAM. Uh, and 64 gigs of RAM is not a lot. It's it's barely, I shouldn't say, there are operating systems that can run two terabytes. So we're talking like grains of salt here when we talk about 64. Uh, our higher levels i9s, uh, i7s, we can get up to 120, 256, even up to a terabyte. Um, and this one here has a max of two channels of memory. But if we look at a motherboard, we'll have four possible sticks, and you can do two channels of that. Those, it is an older one. This also has integrated graphics in it, the Intel HD Graphics 530. The big difference between this integrated graphics and the one on the 34. 100G, 3400G is, is running Ryzen's actual Radon graphics processor on the chip. Uh, this would be like putting an NVIDIA chip on an i5 processor, which they don't do. Intel creates their own graphical chip, but Intel doesn't do graphics cards though. So that has to be taken into consideration. It has a max of 64 gigs of memory, but that is because it's using the same memory, the RAM, uh, that it's capable of doing. So it's just using the available onboard RAM of the motherboard as video memory too at the same time. Let me take a look at some other things that this chip is being able to use. Uh, but this chip's been around for a little bit. It's, it's a little bit old. I think I've had this chip for around four, just about four years probably. So most of its specs are I mean, they're a little outdated comparatively, but it can handle its job. This chipset could do what it's asking you to do. So if you wanted to mine Bitcoin, would the chip you choose need to be one that you mentioned? Um, I'll tell you the truth. Uh, CPUs don't matter at all when it comes to bit mining. <laughs> uh, when it comes to Bitcoin, you don't want to go, you want to go GPU. Uh, a high-end GPU will do significantly more in a better, thorough put on it than any CPU. Uh, most most of the um, Bitcoin mining operations, people have put on and bought like five, six, seven uh, GPUs uh, and you're clustering all those all together, probably running off a very low level Linux operating system and you're loading an operating system onto the GPU to do all this calculation there because a GPU does faster math. Uh, that sounds a little counterintuitive, but that's the truth. Uh, CPU do hardcore math, GPU just does more math quicker. <laughs> that's an i5. 
want to just show everyone a thread over here. Let's go look at the specifications on this guy. So a 3970X, this is probably the most powerful CPU that you can purchase uh, on the market for personal computers. There's always something more. There's always something more powerful. There's always something. This is almost as best as you can do for uh, off, uh, aftermarket personal bills. It's the third rippers. Uh, 32 cores, 64 threads. So each core, two threads. Uh, running at a base of 3.7 gigahertz. I'll talk about GPU in a little bit later. I haven't talked about it yet. I'll talk about these caches here in a second. Those are really important. But the key is it does 4.6 gigahertz. So number is 3.7 or 3,700 hertz per second. So instead of 3.7, it's doing 4.5. So 4,500 hertz per second at its max boosting. Um, think about but that is in math equations. How quickly is that uh, chip doing things? And it has a lot of other uh, little kind of interesting aspects. And something that's really important, it does PCIe 4.0. Intel, most Intel chips that you buy for your home have not moved on to 4.0. They are still sitting on PCIe 3.0 which is an interesting issue when it comes to Intel versus AMD. Also, once you notice that massive amount of uh, power draw, 280 watts. When we looked at the Intel i5, which is low uh, on the tiers to this and the height here, we're almost five times more, three or four times more power, uh, power draw. So that's a lot. It also has a really high temp, 95 degrees. So you really have to be thinking about how you're cooling this. So I want to move on to these other couple on here, specifically the 3400G, because that's the one that uh, going into that, why did we choose a CPU to do something? Uh, most people, when they think gaming, like if you ask, uh, if you go out there and look at a gaming PC, or you talk to a gamer, they're, they're, they're always like, oh, I want to get this high-end chip. I need this. Intel i9 10,000 series, because that is going to be the greatest thing in the world and it's gonna make me have so much better of a game. Not necessarily true. Uh, it can add uh, what we call frames per second, which is an aspect of how uh, quickly images get to your screen, but that does not mean that it's that you're going to have a worse performance on something else. Um, well, this is the 3500G. Let's go look at the specifications. They're so running four cores at eight threads, which is higher than most recommended specifications for 99% of the games on the market. So if you're looking at somebody who's doing gaming and they're like, oh, I need this high end. No, you don't. Uh, an i5, an i7, uh, a Ryzen 5, or a Ryzen 7, they both do uh, that gaming category perfectly fine because they don't need those other items. They just need a little bit of processing and a little bit of thread count. And most gaming isn't even used to thread account. So that's the thing that to think about. Like you don't need a lot of threads. Uh, when we looked at the Intel chip, more cores, less threads. So GPU is a graphics card. That is, that's the thing. The, the graphics processing unit is a graphics card, but you can have it internal, as in the 3400G, or you can have it external, like a right, uh, a Titan or a 28, uh, or RTX 2080 Ti. And that's what we call this graphics processor. So this chipset. So this kind of mentioned like this will run gaming perfectly fine. 
But if I jump over to something like this, the 30, 3900 XT, you're gonna see 12 cores, 24 threads. This is where a lot of people have confusion because you go online, you hear about all these great things like top of the line, best in gaming, best in workstation, uh, the best possible ones out there that money can purchase. 99% of people don't actually need this. Uh, these are all based upon things that are at higher limit. Those people who can afford that higher next, that next tier. Affording the next tier doesn't mean it actually gives you more except in the workstation aspect. When we're talking about doing Photoshop, digital animation, uh, when we start talking that category, we're talking a whole different profession. People who go out there and uh, do architecture, uh, people who do AutoCAD, engineers, uh, any of that category, which is huge, they need a chip like this. They need a 3900 uh, 3, x uh, They need something that's more powerful. Because when those processes start to run, you actually uh, take that file and make it a picture or make it a 3D object, the more cores, the more threads that it has, the more equations that it can throw at, the, uh, at this object, and the quicker it'll get done. So that's kind of the reason why you have to choose that. And why you have to be very, very specific on what is the purpose of this build? Why are we building this machine and what is it going to be doing for us? So for the SFF build that I'm building, its intended purpose to start out with is going to be a streaming machine. Uh, so what I'm going to do with it is from my main desktop, I'm going to be connecting a capture card into it. So I won't be putting a graphics card into it. I will be using the 3400G as my graphics and letting this card output to the monitor. But I'm going to put a capture card into the device so that my host machine, the one I normally do things on, will stream to the streaming machine. And then the streaming machine will handle all of the actual streaming and recording. That way I'm taking the, those processes away from my desktop computer, putting it on a secondary device. And when you do that, you get something interesting happening. You get less, you get more resources available for your desktop computer to run. Whenever you can pull something away and not have it centralized on that processor, the quicker things run, the more resources you've now given it. So that'll allow me to turn my desktop computer into a basically a full on workstation computer. Uh, so now I'm putting it into a different category. Uh, yes, it can do gaming, but it's designed to do work stream, uh, workstation work now. Um, Adobe, Premiere and all that kind of stuff. And uh, with that, that streaming box now has a de uh, designated purpose. This also, this bill, this SF bill that I've been talking about is going to transition. Uh, this quarter is going to go through this. And in the next couple of quarters, it's going to go through another transition. And it'll actually become my primary station, uh, while my main desktop computer is going to become a secondary station. And then I'll go the other direction. I'll stream into it and let this desktop become a full on workhorse uh, where it has significantly more RAM, significantly more. Uh, better CPU, all those factors to make it a workstation. And then I'll just use the SSF build as a kind of small personal use device. So when you buy a brand new processor, so this thing has not been opened yet. This thing I got in the mail several weeks and I've been waiting for this class. So I can pull it out. Because AMD does something very interesting that Intel does not. AMD 
provides us with a cooler. This is the standard Intel uh, AOI cooler. I want you to notice, look at the way the metal is, all the little fins coming off of it. Uh, notice that we have a square already built in there. That little square will work as our uh, thermal paste for this device. Uh, and it's not this little square. If it'll focus on it close enough, you'll notice that it's actually a solid piece of sheet. Uh, we're starting to buy items that instead of using paste, we're starting to use these little tiny square thermal pads to handle our heat. And we don't need something massive for this 3400. There it is. That's 3400. This is not a very expensive car. This only costs about $125. Uh, comparatively, the other parts of this build will be significantly more expensive. But this one here uh, is definitely meant for um, that lower level, that little bit lower level. And because this card is not going to overheat, uh, it's not going to get into the hundreds of degrees and we have to worry about uh, all the thermals with it, this little tiny cooler will actually handle all the heat that it's going to do. So we don't have to worry about doing anything like water cooling uh, or put a giant uh, fan base AOI, um, like you saw me when I did the uh, that time lapse video, I put a giant AOI on there. But I don't have to do that with this one. Uh, this is tiny. And this is something that AMD has done really, really well over the past many, many years is actually providing appropriate coolers for their stock. So you don't have to guess. There's no guessing involved into it. You buy what's appropriate. CPUs have this thing called cache. Uh, so what is a cache? It's memory. And so a CPU has a little bit of memory installed onto it. We're talking like maybe a couple of megabytes here. We're not talking gigs. We're talking a couple of megabytes, like 64 megabytes. Uh, You're sitting there, you're doing math. It's doing math constantly. One plus one, one plus one, two plus two. And it's doing this for hours and hours and hours. But wouldn't it be simpler or more useful for the, if you're doing all this math, to have a cheat sheet on the formulas of the math. So what cache does, and there's a couple of different varieties. There's like L2, L3, cache. What if as calculation is going through, it's storing a commonly used equation so that instead of having to re-ask what that, well, try to re-figure out what that formula is, you can look over there and go, hey, I, I need that equation. So I'm going to pull that in there and use it and then drop it back into the clash. So it doesn't need a lot of memory. It only needs these little tiny pieces of memory. And then it, it, as the equations go through there, it pulls that little piece in there and goes, hey, I need this to do this piece of equation over here, and then it moves on. That's the importance of cash. So it doesn't keep anything super, super valuable. And it'll lose that those calculations every time the CPU is turned off. Uh, not an issue, because as the CPU starts doing its business and starts working on things, uh, it, it has it available. It, it'll just figure it out and be like, okay, I now know what two plus two is. I don't need to do the math again. I'll just know the formula for it. Um, but that's all the cache does. And there's obviously quicker and quicker and quicker flash uh, cache available for us, depending on what, what type of equations it's doing. RAM. What is RAM? Random access, random access memory. Here in my hand, this is Corsair 16 gig DDR4 RAM. This is Vengeance Pro, which means this is their RGB RAM. Uh, if I plug this into a computer, a desktop computer is gonna light up. Uh, this can be overclocked to 3200 uh, gigahertz. 
but I'll talk a little bit about overclocking RAM here in a second. But this specific set, this specific card is bent. And you're probably not gonna be able to see it because the bend is so tiny. Uh, you're probably not going to see it very well, but there's a little, little tiny bend in this card because when it was sitting in a motherboard, instead of sitting flat and straight, uh, an AOI cooler was on it and it was pushing to the side just a little tiny bit on the top. So the top portion where the RGB is, was being bent in. The funny thing is, is that I'm fairly certain this stick of RAM will still work. Um, but that's a different story. RAM is nearly as important as the CPU when you're taking into consideration. Like I said, this is 3200 gigahertz RAM. This over here, this is HyperX. They're a company that makes a whole bunch of different types of peripherals and some RAM and some other cool little items out there. Uh, this is DDR4 HyperX RAM, and this has a max of 20, uh, 2666. So, on our initial thought process, if we think about this, we're going to instantly think this RAM is better because it runs at a higher rate. And then this RAM is not as good because it's only running at the 2666. So, let's kind of dispel some of that to start out with. This is good RAM at 2666. Not all CPUs are capable of handling RAM at that higher rate. Uh, not all motherboards are capable of running RAM at that higher rate. So a standard computer out of the box, most modern parts run at 2666, which means this 3400G CPU that's going to pair with this is going to use all of its capabilities. And it's going to kind of, they're going to pair with each other. So I don't need 3200 gigahertz RAM on that CPU because that CPU is never going to be able to use that. Other interesting thing. Uh, going back to that conversation I was just having about so people think they need, but they don't actually. Uh, you don't need to actually run at uh, 3200 or 3600. Um, and there are some RAMs out there that run to the 4000s. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the overclocking here in a, second, in a couple minutes. Uh, most applications, most things only need 2660. Most gaming doesn't need that. Where the higher hertz RAM has more benefits is again in workstation activities. So yes, overclocking the RAM, overclocking the RAMs when you go into the motherboard and we have this thing called XMP profiles. Uh, your motherboard, when you uh, connect the RAM to it, will identify that it has a higher capability than what it's showing and you can select a XMP profile that matches the highest capability of that RAM. Um, a lot of times when they talk about high-end gaming, they'll say the sweet spot's around 3200. Again, high-end, meaning you have a high-end card, a high-end motherboard, high-end CPU, high-end RAM, high-end motherboard. All the pieces are high-end because if they're not all high end, you put one low end part on it, you're bottlenecking everything. So, back to this HyperX RAM that's running at 2660. This is completely capable of running any game that's out there. Uh, and going to the fact that I'm not using this machine for gaming and it's running it as more of a uh, connection device between two things, it doesn't need to get 3200 RAM. You have this thing called uh, dual channel when it comes with RAM. 
and a dual channel stick with a dual channel motherboard, meaning that it's going to use both sticks of RAM in tandem to get the max performance out of both the motherboard, the CPU, and the stick of RAM all at the same time. If you were to put a single stick of RAM, even if this thing is, so this one's here, 16 gigs, uh, 16 gigs of RAM, we can run at 3200. If I were to put this into one lane on the motherboard and not use the, any of the other uh, lanes, I will not get the same benefit as if I were to use this running at a lower rate, but using dual channel. So this inherently will be better than a single stick of RAM. And if I were to combine, so this on the other hand, if I were to do two sticks of 16 gig RAM uh, running at 3200 and actually setting it to run at 3200 versus two sticks at 2666, this will do better. Because not only is this uh, running faster, this is more RAM. So let's we'll talk about that. One stick, 16 gigs. If I'm running this dual channel, I'd be running at 32 gigs. This is a total of 16 gigs, meaning each card is only eight gigs. And this is the sweet spot for most PCs. So this is going into a different category of stuff. Eight gigs combined to make 16. You don't need 16. Most average gamers, most most work machines, most computers that people are using uh, don't need more than 16. And this has been proven uh, because the only thing that bogs down RAM is objects that are constantly storing things in there. And unless you're working on a workstation computer where you have hundreds and hundreds of objects trying to go through at the same time, that it's the only time that having more RAM is really beneficial. Uh, sitting there and using Chrome. Yes, Chrome is a RAM hog, but you really shouldn't be trying to have 64 tabs of, of Chrome open at the same time. That is not hardware issue. That is user issue. Um, and it's actually been thrown by the, if you toss in two terabytes of RAM into a computer, which you can do on select motherboards, you can open like 3000 tabs of Chrome because each tab takes a little bit under a gig of RAM uh, of space when you're talking about that many. And those are all videos running and all that kind of stuff too. So again, going back to the build that we're doing, buying appropriately, we only need 16 gigs of RAM. Most people only need 16 gigs of RAM. So can you run off three sticks? No, you can't put three sticks into a machine. You can buy it. Uh, you can buy three sticks of RAM, but the moment you were to put all three in there and connect, you would not get any special features of it. Uh, it might turn on and it might run that third stick that is running in a non dual channel lane by itself because uh, it's missing its partner will would just not run uh, the other two that are running dual channel will run perfectly fine but you're going to be losing all the dual channel capabilities uh, and this would be basically a completely worthless stick of ram in a three ram setup so you're not going to see them out there. You're always going to see RAM paired in six of two. Uh, most operating systems, this includes Windows, um, are upper thresholds about 128 to 256 when it comes to RAM. You can buy a version of Windows called Workstation, and it is not the same thing as Windows 10 Pro. A lot of people want to confuse that. They're not the same thing. Windows Workstation allows you to put in an unlimited amount of RAM. Going back to that workstation, and I'm gonna keep on bringing that up whenever I talk about higher end builds, because you're doing those other things, AutoCAD, Photoshop, Premiere, um, 
you're not necessarily going to have any benefit whatsoever of having two terabytes of RAM to run a video game. You're not going to have any benefit whatsoever having two terabytes of RAM running Excel. <laughs> uh, most boards run four. Most standard ATX size boards, and I'll talk about motherboards next week, um, run four sticks of RAM. The build that I'm going to be doing, because it's an ITX build, will only have two sticks. And as I said, we'll talk about that another time. The purpose of RAM is to hold memory. So you have that cache on the CPU. It is doing math. And it's doing math really, really fast. But RAM doesn't do math. It holds information for the operating system and some stuff for uh, the CPU. We have something called page file, and occasionally things over. But RAM holds stuff that's important that needs to be brought up quickly. And when you're running things, stuff will get stored on here. You ever notice that if you have a certain application that you constantly use, uh, Windows launches that application quicker? It's because when Windows loads up, it already knows the profile of the person. It says, hey, they're more likely to use this specific application. So they're gonna pull that application and kind of pre-start it inside of RAM. And then that's where things start moving quicker at because this runs quicker than a solid state drive, which runs quicker than a mechanical drive. And if it's being stored in here for short term, for quick stuff, then it's really, really quick. Think about like you're on a computer and you minimize and then bring up the stuff on your desktop. All that's happening in RAM, not on the actual SSD or any of that. You just bring it up inside the RAM. So if you sit there and you try to like open up like 20 different programs, yeah, you're probably gonna bog down the RAM. <laughs> But if you open one or two at the at times and only keeping what you need to have running to rerunning, you can get away with going all the way down to like two gigs. How do Apple products handle RAM? So for the most part, for their average, uh, their most of their consumer grade stuff, it follows the same principles. You're only going to set up between 16 and 32 gigs of RAM. Uh, I do know their their Pro series, uh, which thank God that Pro series. If you haven't seen the Pro series. Let's toss that up there so I can wrap on this one a little bit. This is a Mac Pro. It looks like a cheese grater. And I I, I will say that you're definitely going to hear the term cheese grater um, in the professional world whenever we talk about Mac Pros. Um, we're also going to make fun of it a lot. Um, so this is kind of a really interesting build. Uh, Apple has done a lot of work and they designed this specifically for high-end workstation mentality. Uh, if you're buying this and you're not doing uh, digital art or animation, then you bought $5,000 piece of machine or $10,000 piece of machine that you're never going to utilize in the way that it was designed to do. I'll look up the price here in a second. This thing is a little bit ridiculous. There we go. Let's take a look at this. So this is kind of insides of it. And you notice how everything is kind of its own little uh, contained unit. It's using Ryden Pro Vega 2s, which are graphics cards. Um, together at once, uh, comparatively, the, uh, NVIDIA uses Quattro. And I'll talk about graphics cards in the video. Uses only up to 24 cores of power. 64 PCIe Express lanes. Let's see if we can get the tech specs on this guy. Okay. So it's running an Inton Xeon W processor, meaning that it is one of the best Intel chips that's out there. And it's running on eight cores at 3.5 gigahertz. For their lowest version. Their highest version is running at a 28 core. You can buy this up to 
700 and oh sorry no I missed one 1.5 terabytes of ram meaning that they have a total of 12 slots available on this device to be able to put rams in each stick would have to be running at 128 gigs and that's that's their max that's the max that apple has created uh, and you're not probably going to sit there and add ram in yourself so we have that timing thing so the 2666 the 3200 the 3600 uh all those big numbers there's actually ddr5 and ddr5 is available they have designed it uh, it's not a commercially purchasable yet at this point in time because there is no motherboard or CPU in existence that runs it because we have not gotten there and there's no use for it on uh, anything outside of the scientific side of things. So don't expect to go be buying DDR5 anytime in the next couple of years unless AMD magically announces it tomorrow morning. There's an AMD event tomorrow morning at eight o'clock in the morning. They will announce the next set of chips. So 2666. When we talk about gigahertz again, hertz dealing with timing. How many thousands of things is it sending and doing per second? So at 2666 hertz, coupled with a processor that is doing at, uh, at 3.65, uh, if you couple those two things together, uh, Rounded down here, like a 2.6 uh, in that 3.6. Um, that's how many calculations the RAM's doing. And then you have all the processing that the CPU is doing. So the RAM can hold information and move it around per second at a really fast rate. The CPU is doing all of its calculations really, really fast. Uh, and a lot of that information is being passed off through the PCIs uh, to the RAM, and they're really, really close. So we're talking like fractions of centimeters here. Um, they get that information going to the sticks and then passing that information on. That's all that that RAM, all that timing you hear with RAM, all that number is the higher the number, the faster it's moving. The thing is, if your CPU is not capable of doing that, then it's unused stats. It's a bot, it's what we call bottleneck. If you don't have a CPU that's capable of running at 4,000, guess what? Your CPU is you've lost you've lost a lot of that ram capability or on the other side if i were to put this ram that's 2660 and i put this on my 3950x i am losing a lot of capabilities of this chip because this ram cannot keep up build for what you're trying to do i think that's a common phrase and now hopefully that's what's in your mind from this point forward is build for what you're trying to do if you overshoot, that's fine. But undershooting and buying equipment or not taking consideration what you're, what this machine is going to do can cause more harm and waste money. So it's really, really important to take this into consideration. All right, everybody. I think that's all I'm going to talk about. You have a good night. Bye.